I'm Lachlan Evenson, and I'm uh, one of the Kubernetes charts maintainers. Is anybody using Kubernetes charts Woo! upstream? Woo -hoo! Thank you. Thank you for contributing and making it a great place for people to get started on, on Kubernetes. So big thank you to, all, to you all. And over here I have my esteemed friend and colleague, Adam Reese. He is a Helm core maintainer. Uh, he's been there from day one. He's been fighting the good fight, making Helm what it is. So I think between us both, we've got a little bit of experience about Helm. So we hope to take you on a 30 minute journey. We're gonna have a lot of fun. And at the end, there's gonna be a little fun demo for you all. So basically, hang in for that, stay awake. Otherwise, I'll wake you up with the splash. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, so show of hands. You're probably tired of this question. Who's running Kubernetes in production? Woohoo! Fantastic, fantastic, great. And who's running Helm? Right, okay. You, tell me what Helm is. Because <laughs> I don't know. Kubernetes package manager. Okay, Helm is the Kubernetes package. Correct, correct. Come on down, come on down and win your prize. No, it's okay, it's okay. You can say that. <laughs> say that. I'm going to make you do a backflip, do a circus thing. Okay, can you really do that? Sing the Helm anthem. Sing the Helm anthem, you know that too. Um, so Helm is a package manager for Kubernetes. Now, what if I said that? Helm is not just a package manager. What? Helm is not just a package manager. What? What? Did I hear Matt Butcher say that? that it was not pre-approved, sorry. Didn't sign off on this. But I want you all to think about, and what we're going to spend 30 minutes doing, is thinking about what else can we make Helm do? So we all know Helm is a, a package manager, but how can we stretch Helm and actually make it do some other things? So today we're going to, I want to challenge you all, come with an open mind. We'll show you what Helm can do today, but let's think about and brainstorm what else we can do with Helm. Everybody okay with that? Yeah. And the audience said? Woo! Fantastic. Thank you so much for being awake. Okay, fantastic. So before we get into the, the nitty gritty of why I'm saying Helm is not just a package manager, let's give you just a little bit of history about Helm. And, and for that, I'm going to hand you over to uh, Adam, and Adam is going to kick this off. So please give Adam a round of applause. Woo! There you go. Right, thanks. So, um, start. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, I was going to take a step through um, the journey of onboarding onto Kubernetes. Um, kind of talk about how we got to where we were and why we ended up um, building Helm. So, so Adam, uh, hang on. Why did you choose Romancing the Cube? I'm glad you asked that, Lachlan. Yeah, sorry, it's like it's scripted. Um, <laughs> so uh, as an engineer, which uh, I'm sure many of you in here are and can relate to this, um, when I see a new piece of technology come out that's uh, growing as fast as Kubernetes, I have to acquire it and um, earn the Oracle status on it. So uh, um, it, it, it starts getting built up a little bit and the excitement builds and you want to implement um, and start investigating everything about it. Yeah. So starting the process, I, I go to the GitHub repo, um, clone the repository, and want to have a cluster up and running. So this was life before Minikube. So Who was Kubernetes. around before Minikube? Do you remember those days? How long did cluster up take? <laughs> go yeah. ahead, go ahead. Yeah, it, it hurt. <laughs> it hurt. Um, so there was a vagrant script in the root and provisioning it. Uh, you had to make sure, one, that your power was plugged in because the battery would die in like 20 minutes after doing your uh, cube up. And then about the fourth try, you get a cluster running um, after you see all this scroll for a long time. And then... Yes, I have a local cluster. Um, so Fantastic. that's when the party Crack starts. It's like, right? Yeah, it's Crack like high fives in the We're office. Done, ready for it's, uh, people are carrying you around on shoulders, and it's just awesome. And then you sit down at your desk again, and you stare at this cluster, and it just stares back at you. Um, <laughs> and you kind of prod it with a lucky. stick. Lucky, yeah. And then it prods you, you back. To, yeah. You say, don't do that. What does it do? How do I make this thing do tricks? Yeah, so it, I, it wasn't that impressive at that level. So um, 
you know, I, I want to kick the tires. I, I want to install something. I need some knobs to, to turn. You know, I, I want to see some logs. I want to like browse to some application that's running on it. So uh, one of the first things I learned was that um, people that are in the Kubernetes community, they have a lot of parties. And they like to track and analyze the uh, number of guests they have. Um, so my first experience was uh, just this. Uh, copy YAML, paste YAML, fix indents, and repeat. So this kind of gave me a, a bit of a working knowledge of the different resource types and how they all work together. Actually, I personally never got past three. <laughs> that was, I, I was stuck. And then as soon as I have some sort of base knowledge of these different resource types, you know, I, I want to build a proof of concept. If I have an app, existing application, I want to um, build that out in a manifest and deploy it. Um, so I started with what I knew and grabbed the guestbook application and started plugging different stuff in, which ended in uh, copy YAML, paste YAML, fix indents, and repeat. So if I made it this far, <laughs> then uh, Who has this as their top endorsement? It's mine. It's at the top of my resume on LinkedIn. YAML guru. Yeah, so that, that was a proud day. <laughs> so looking at Helm's place in this journey, um, Helm uh, gave away in that initial um, stage of, I have a cluster running. Um, I want something that's, that's real. Um, I mean, sorry, not real, I shouldn't say that. Uh, not guest book. Um, <laughs> so uh, it, it provided a way that you know, applications that you knew, like if you wanted Redis running, then it provided a real easy way. I could just do a, a Helm install stable Redis, and I, I had it up and running. And I, I had something that I was familiar with that I could play with. Um, I could pull up the other parts of my app and just have something running. So the other place, which what we want to get into is uh, it also enables um, moving to production uh, for it has the templating functionalities as well as um, re repeatability. So uh, how is Helm being used today? There is the, the package manager, I forget. Yeah, our star student up front. Um, <laughs> That's why he sat in the front. So it, the, the package manager, um, you know, we can install stable applications. We have enough configuration options that we can um, tweak some knobs and get it running exactly how we need to. We can get stuff talking together. Um, you know, this repository that we have is backed by the community, so we can leverage the knowledge that Everybody shares, if somebody pulls something up and it just gets hosed, then you know, they can phone all their friends and say, hey, don't do this. And uh, you know, it serves as a learning ground that we can all um, develop some best practices because this is such a new technology. Like, um, and there's not one way to, to write YAML. Um, so we can figure out, like, okay, what's the best approach to some of this stuff? What's the best approach to labels? Um, what's the best approach to naming conventions, all that? Yeah, so I think, you know, rounding out that first section, take a look at what Helm and, and where people are using it today. I think that's fairly common for those using Helm. They're using it to, you know, get the upstream charts and start playing with uh, putting resources onto Kubernetes. So, you know, if we take a look at that being at where most folks are now, let's take a quick look at what the core components of Helm are before we start to introduce what else we think Helm can do. So let's take another look at charts. Yeah, and since uh, I think everybody raised their hand that used Helm, or should. Yeah, hands up. No. Cool. I, th I think that's everybody. That's uh, everybody. <laughs> Minus uh, that guy there, he hasn't. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to focus on um, charts. You know, charts are kind of the heart and soul of Helm. Uh, it's the package that encapsulates um, all the different resource types. So Kubernetes gives you resources that um, allow you to compose your application. And then Helm allows you to group those together in a logical unit to manage it um, with a, a single, single interface. Oh, it's an IR one, not Channel Bluetooth. Um, 
So charts can be installed from the repository, which we were talking about before. Um, they can also be installed from a local file path. So if you wanted to have it like in your repo um, for your application, it checked into your version control, uh, Helm would support that. You could just run Helm against the, the local file path. And watch this on the right. Oh yeah, I skipped that. Go didn't back. You? Who here has used uh, QBAPS, gone to QBAPS.com? Do you like it? Give it a shout out. So that's actually the, the work of another project called Monocular, which gives this kind of UI on top of Helm and, and one of the, to call you out, Adnan, put your hands together for Adnan. I think, I think Monocular is fantastic. <laughs> but it actually makes this, the whole front end, quite usable. So if you have not been to kubeapps.com, I suggest you go there and it may be the first time you install something on Kubernetes um, successfully. <laughs> Who knows? Besides guestbook. Besides guestbook. <laughs> so, looking at charts, so I think charts being an integral part of Helm, you know, as container images are to containers and you can ship those units everywhere, uh, let's think about charts in the context of Helm and how we can actually use Helm uh, to do more than just move charts around. So, we want to introduce concepts of what we think Helm's other hats might be. Go ahead. Switch hats. Okay, so uh, life cycle management's a big one. Um, so uh, this is something that was introduced in um, Helm 2.0, where uh, we can do updates, rollbacks, um, configuration management, um, also testing, which uh, is an awesome feature that uh, our very own Michelle Norelli worked on. Thanks, Michelle. Just hiding, hiding, hiding there, hiding there. <laughs> Um, also repeatability, because we save state. So if your cluster gets in um, a, a bad way, um, you're going to be able to, to pull up your environment again. Uh, something else is configuration management. Um, so here's an example of installing uh, into a, uh, a specific cluster, which is the cube context, and specific values which is development YAML. So you can have development, staging, and production, um, which is a lot like the Rails model, which I hear a lot of people like. <laughs> and uh, inheritance. So uh, Helm allows you to, it, it allows code reuse, where you can um, use it for standardizing certain fields. Um, you can standardize labels and have that be templated throughout. Um, you know, like if you want to enforce that uh, a certain group has uh, a specific label with their group in your org, like you can enforce that kind of stuff. Um, so policy enforcement. Um, also, if you have a monitoring or um, logging system that is used for your company across all applications. Well, th that could be included in a chart as well. And you could just have it out of the box every time. Um, also, uh, reduced number of indent errors. I think just on that standardized deployments, for those that use the upstream chart repo, one of the things the maintainers are working on is actually a base level chart that you can just inherit from. So you don't have to worry about copying and pasting charts. Um, and you will be able to just come in and change the bits that you need to. Um, so I think that's incredibly valuable. So if you have a policy-wide change, uh, the thing we see the most problematic is actually between versions, tags change, alpha notations, beta notations. Um, so we'll have actually a, a standard way to move um, those changes through without everybody having to update all of their charts. So that's incredibly valuable. Yeah, on, on a large uh, manifest, it's, it's really hard to go in there and make sure you update every single label definition because they all need to be the same. Um, and you end up uh, fixing it. Fixing indents. Uh, so composition. So uh, microservices. So uh, most of the time when you do a deployment with microservices, you, you don't just want like your one microservice there. You know it, it needs its buddies to, to work and be useful. Um, so for that we have dependency management. So charts can actually be included in other charts. Um, and they can be composed together to, to build out your, um, your application that way. And we've seen a few big examples of that, um, one of them being OpenStack and also Day's workflow. Um, there, there's 
uh, the charts online, you can go and look at them. Uh, it's a decent read. Um, I think going through them, like the OpenStack one, I forget is how many. Yeah, lines, the SAP folks and the AT and T folks have OpenStack charts published, yeah. and it speaks to how you can actually co compose more complex applications and actually have them work and run on top of Kubernetes. So if anybody's interested, come and talk to us after this and we can point you in your direction. So, okay, Crocs and more. So if anybody has ever seen me speak before, you know I'm on a relentless uh, pursuit to actually make crocodiles really popular in the world. Yep. Does anybody like crocodiles? So what I'm gonna do, nobody likes crocodiles? I don't like them either. Crocodiles are terrible. You do not want it, they eat dogs and they're just not, not nice animals in, in general. But uh, what I'm gonna do is actually take the stuff that Adam's spoken about and spend a lot of time in showing you how we can actually use Helm in different contexts. So what I want to do is just get those creative juices flowing in every, everybody's brain, and let's see what we can do with this. So are you ready to come on a, a demo journey? Who likes demos? OK. All right, now I'm no longer Lockie the presenter. I just got to change my hat. I'm now Lockie the app developer. And I'm going to go. I've got a game about Crocs. It's going to change the world. Some of you may have seen it, but I haven't quite uh, made the billion dollars and retired yet. So let's see if we can change that here and now. Um, so like any good demo, Let's start with an IDE. <laughs> um, but I'm an app developer, and I may not know anything about Kubernetes, and I may not know anything about containers, so let's just start from there, right? So I've got my app, and I want to make a change to my application. So uh, it's a Go web app. I happen to know that I have um, my source code here, and all I need to do is actually change. Um, one little thing, I'm changing the JavaScript from one version to another. So let me pop over and, and just prove to you that there's no so I've made this change. This is not pre-recorded. I'm not feigning typing. Um, but let's see if the demo gods bite me for saying that. Um, so let me just check that in, and I'm going to bump JS version. Now before I actually check this in, what I may want to do is just show you what Croc Hunter is, because if you, you may die not knowing. I don't want anybody to pass out not knowing how wonderful it is. So Croc, Croc Hunter is here. I've got to make a change. Uh, Croc, Croc Hunter is a great game. It's out in production, um, but my boss just told me that you can't shoot crocodiles with laser. So Croc, Croc Hunter is back. Let's go ahead and make this change. So I'm going to check this in and push it into Git. All right. Yay. All right. So what I'll now do is go over and take a look. So I have a Jenkins server here. What Jenkins should do is actually get that webhook. You can see that it's fired. Who uses Jenkins here? Anybody use Jenkins? Sorry, I didn't get Blue Ocean or whatever it's called. I'm still on the old GUI. Maybe, maybe next demo. But what's happened is um, I see that my dev branch has been fired inside Jenkins. Um, you can see the builder status over there for the, uh, the build of my dev branch. Now, what I actually have here is, let me just pull it up. is the dev branch is running here and we have all the stages. Who uses Jenkins Pipeline? So I have Jenkins Pipeline job here and I'm going through all the stages. So what I'm actually doing here is, is building my artifact. So I had a Go app. I'm going to test it. I'm going to put it inside a container and publish that container out. And I actually have my chart for this application configured and checked into my repo. So under my source repo here, and let me just increase my font. I actually have my charts checked into my source repository. So as Adam mentioned, you not only have to have, you can have charts in repositories or you can have charts in just your source code. And I think uh, I would challenge people, why not put them in your source repository? That's where you put everything else. If changes need to be the way to uh, the way you deploy your app, it's a, actually a common place to put them in there. The people that need to see the changes for the deployment can review them and you can go through the standard Git workflow. So I'm actually going to update my application um, from the checkout using a chart and Helm. So let's see how this is going now. Um, it looks like it's already run. OK, great. So I've got a green. Now, as I mentioned, what actually happens here is, I'll see if I can increase the font so you can see this. But as part of my build steps, I actually not only check that I can get to Kubernetes, I use Helm here and actually check that my chart can be built and can, um, and can be tested. 
So I'll show you where the chart test here. So I do a helmet net, and then I actually do a chart test and a dry run install of my application on Kubernetes. So I'm using Helm actually to test that I can put this resources on Kubernetes. And, and I'm also using Helm test, so I'll show you how that works um, in a minute. But by the end of this, I'm going to publish a container out to Quay.io that I should be able to reference and pull in. So here's Quay. You should see now that all I've done is git push, and I actually have uh, a container artifact with my branch and my git char that's pushed out and, and available. So while I do that, let me just prep my changes for production. So I can see that it's gone through the whole build pipeline. I should now be able to do a, a pull request. Um, OK, so I bump the JS version. And let's just go ahead and, and open that up. All right. So here's pull 54. So I can actually see that here's my change ready to go. I can also see that Jenkins has picked this up and it's actually running a build off the PR. So I'll show you what's happening here. Um, Jenkins is configured to watch, watch this repo. It's seen that a PR has gone and we're actually going to build and merge on the base master branch and run that same pipeline again. So again, I haven't touched Kubernetes and I haven't touched um, any container commands. This is all being triggered. So why not, while we wait for that PR to be built, let's go and pick up that artifact that was cut off dev and just test it locally and make sure it actually works. OK, so bef before I go over to that, let's just pick up the artifact name. Actually, sorry to switch screens around, doing the screen dance. I'll just pick up this artifact name. Um, so the, the, the tag on the container here is, is there. And now I should be able to use Helm to install that. OK, so I'll do a Helm install. Let me make sure I'm in the right directory. So because I'm installing from my Git repository, I have the chart locally there. I can do a Helm install. Um, I can give it the charts directory and the croc hunter. I'm going to set uh, the image tag to equal the image tag that was just cut off my branch. And I'm just going to deploy it to a namespace so I can test on this Kubernetes cluster called Levo test. Down the bottom half of the screen, I'm actually just uh, running a watch on that namespace. So we get wayfaring orangutan. Is there any other type? Um, and what we see is my application has been pushed out with Helm, so the same deployment process that I've just stepped through in Jenkins, I can now replicate. And that speaks to what Adam was saying about re repeatability. So I can pick up the artifact and the Helm chart, the deployment, and deploy it to another cluster and test it locally and start playing with it. So how about I actually do that? Um, uh, test. Uh, Helm test. Helm last. Wait, what is that? Helm last, last plugins. So Helm has a nice plugin thing. I won't go into it today, but I'm actually doing a test. So I'm using the test suite actually to test that my application works. And the way the test suite works in Helm is it actually goes out and runs commands inside Kubernetes, and you get a, a red green. So not only am I testing that my app can be installed on Kubernetes, I'm also testing that it works. So I've just gone and replicated a test on a completely different cluster to the one that uh, runs my production workload. And I was able to pick that up and run it again. So I even have a, a story here to get some laptop development going uh, fairly quickly using the same deployment architecture that the, the Jenkins um, pipeline is using. So let me delete that and clean it up. And let's see if my PR built. So I'm just going to clean that up, assume that I'm done with it. OK, my pull request um, is green. We're all good there. So let's go back to. Um, Go back to GitHub here. Check that I'm green here. OK, so I've got a green green tick. That's never a bad thing. So I should just be able to go out and actually merge this pull request. All right, so for the final, the final trick here, uh, Jenkins will again pick up the change to master, but this time it will actually go out and deploy to that app that I showed you at the start. So um, it's going to not only do a dry run, it's going to do a test and push it out um, once it passes all that. So you can see the master branch has already come up here. Now for bonus points while that's building, um, let me just uh, introduce you to another little trick here. This Jenkins cluster that I'm using here was actually built um, using Helm. So I did a Helm install stable Jenkins. 
and I've just installed Jenkins from the upstream chart repo, and I have, you have all this at your fingertips. So here's actually Jenkins running. You can see 22 seconds ago, the agent came up, and the agent is performing my build. So that's running on the same cluster that's running um, my production application. So I think another persona that's probably maybe not as well represented with Helm is, is the operator level. So as an operator, I could package up Jenkins for my company and make it consumable by all my app devs. So just to peel back the curtain on what's happening here is Jenkins is actually installed, and I just installed it um, two days ago to run this demo. So let's go back and make sure that this thing's happening. OK, so at the moment, it's actually just building um, my container, and then it'll publish that container out to, to Quay. At this point, you know, I want to round out and get you start thinking. Is there any questions while we wait for this to finish? I think, yeah, gentleman up the front. Um, you're obviously running on Jenkins, but yep. um, presumably you have to configure Jenkins and build pipe by yourself and all that sort of stuff. So. Yeah, so absolutely. The, the question was, I'm running it on Jenkins, so com presumably I had to go configure all the pipeline. So I'll show you what I had to configure um, for this, and it was just this. There's no other configuration. I just had to tell it to log in and scan. It's a public repo, but get rate limited, so I'm using some credentials, and go and grab my repo. That means the build steps are actually checked in to my source repository. So all Jenkins does is read this file in, and it knows exactly what to do. And I'm using Helm for the last mile down here, so if branch equals master, go, go ahead and do a Helm deploy, and I'm going to deploy that chart out with that upgraded artifact. So to answer your question, you need to have a file that Jenkins can read in, but you can programmatically add a file, much like the, uh, you know, the SAS provided Travis, Circle, the likes of those folks, read a YAML file out of your repository. So I didn't do anything to Jenkins apart from tell it what repo to look at here. OK, so we should be OK with um, master's gone out. And for the final kicker here, let's see. Right, so the git shower is here, and yay. Now I no longer shoot lasers, I actually shoot fish, which is a much, much nicer uh, experience. Don't know that you want. I don't condone feeding crocodiles fish by, by any stretch of the imagination. But you can see how I've used Helm in the context of a CI pipeline to actually drive all my updates, have reusability locally, um, and, and manage my deployments using uh, source version controlling. So, uh, make the swamp safe again. Make the swamp safe again. So, fantastic. At this point, I will open it up for questions. Um, and if you're interested in the slide deck, there's actually exactly what happened as a diagram. So, if you're interested in just understanding exactly what I did in that flow um, or have questions about it, but we'll open it up. Yeah, Any and questions? And the repos on uh, GitHub, you can go check it out. Yep. It's all open source. You can rebuild that demo on your own. Um, so it's, it's all for the taking. Uh, get your hands dirty and ask us questions. Yes? Where were the tests running? Are you running locally? So um, the, for Helm tests specifically, you actually define a pod manifest, and it executes a pod manifest inside Kubernetes. So it'll actually go and do any arbitrary tests. So what I'm actually doing in my test, just to um, peel that back for folks, is um, let me show you here. So because I have my chart here, I can, I can go and um, show you where the tests live. And over here in templates, I have tests. And a test, this test is actually doing a wget against a service name inside Kubernetes and just making sure I can pull slash. So I'm actually testing that that, that comes up. So you can define any tests and any type of containers. If you had MySQL, you could log in, you could create a table, you could create a database. Um, and do the same thing. Thank you. Great, great question. Any other questions? Any other questions? Gentlemen. What's your take on managing variables uh, for different environments, maybe secret uh, logging who changed what? OK. Yeah, so the, the question was, what's my take on managing environments, secrets? Uh, do you want to have a stab at that first? Um, you mean uh, secrets? Um, Kubernetes secrets, or did you say environment variables, or? I mean, just all the, all the variables require to deploy computation on a different environment. Of course, one of the issues will be with different secrets. So you can, yeah, you can treat secrets like uh, just Kubernetes secrets, but still you want to template that. 
Um, right. So uh, all the configuration is managed um, within the chart where you can define all the, um, all the values. So um, I, did you want to pull up the values? Yeah, I'll one? show the values of this repo. Sure. Um, and that, that defines like all, all the different parameters, parameterization, uh, I can talk, of the, the, the chart. Um, so these are all the different values you can configure and pass in. And uh, secrets are handled just like any other Kubernetes resource. Um, the, the templating happens, and then essentially it just builds the YAML for you, so you don't have to do the copy YAML, paste YAML, and fix it, and repeat. And it will uh, just um, install it directly into Kubernetes from there. So, so there's, there's no um, magic happening between the two. Um, yeah, there was some. Sorry, got excited. Um, uh, That's Adam and Adam. <laughs> uh, there was quite a bit of discussion about that um, not too long ago. Um, it kind of fizzled out. I don't really remember the yeah. I've seen the some reason for it. Implement it outside of Helm, but there's no reason that it couldn't become a piece. Um, what I've done in the past when I ran ran this was you'd have a subset, and Helm can reference external files in the values, so you can say go get this from here, and then you just need some process to go put that file in place, and you just read from that file and pull it in, right? Mm -hmm. So instead of having hard fixed, you can actually say go get the value from that file. So I've seen people go and, um, you know, go and grab this from over here, and you have some process to put that there, and that's just the result of pulling it from a key val store. So, um, and then inside something like, uh, in the context of that app, you have environment specific uh, YAML files. So you could say dev, staging, prod, and you just say, if my branch is this, use this YAML file which says point to these files here. Um, that's what I've seen most commonly used for environment specific solutions. Yeah, and all, all the configuration is saved in state on the cluster. Um, so you don't have to pass the configuration each time for like doing upgrades and stuff like that. Yes, gentlemen there. Yes, so, yeah, I, I could probably take it. Is mm -hmm. that all right? You want to take it? So Helm has two components. There's a server-side component called Tiller, and Tiller has uh, a gRPC interface. So you can either uh, talk directly to that, and somebody, uh, in a community member's implemented a HTTP REST gateway as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you could stick a, a REST gateway on the front. Um, the, the Helm commands that I were running were just interfacing with Tiller um, through gRPC. So the Helm client is just an implementation of that, but you could implement your own client and your own process. We're, see, we're seeing more and more of that in the community. Um, yes. Yeah, um, there's also a yep, like skip, skip box cabin, I believe, just uses the gRPC. They build their own client. For they it. built their own client, yeah. Um, I think Stuart does as well. I'm sure somebody can correct me if I'm lying in here. Yes? Yes, yeah, yeah. My, my dislike for YAML is just above my dislike for JSON. But they're both my two most endorsed skills on LinkedIn. <laughs> From cloud formation, I learned a lot of J JSON. Yeah, with JSON, it's not as much about fixing indents, but it's that damn last comma. Comma and no me. comments. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so the question was, have we seen the project landscaper? Um, yeah, um, that, um, the guy that built that is actually very active with, with us in the project, and yeah, it's, it's an awesome project. Um, we do have plans for something similar to that. Um, not not the, the composing the many charts together as a logical unit. Um, essentially what he did was, uh, what we did to uh, Kubernetes resources, he took it a step further and did charts on that but also provided a lot of functionality around um, uh, like diff outputs and stuff like that. So it, it's a really cool project. But as far as baking in like the, the abstraction layer that he did, um, there's no plans for that. I think one of the, the goals of Helm was to keep it as simple as possible, and then if there's other tooling, it can be built around it. Um, so call it following like the, the Unix model there, 
Have, have you used Landscaper? Yeah, it was a different approach to like uh, dependency management as well. Um, we took the approach of like vendoring uh, resources, so actually putting them uh, in, inside the the chart. Um, that's just a look at you know keeping them all on the same level and installing them. Right. Right. And I believe like orchestration a little bit too. Yeah. Well. So before we just round it out, we're out of time. Uh, both Adam and myself will be at the Deus booth. So if you want to swing by and ask any more questions, I'd encourage you to do that. But thank you very much for joining.